We're back here at Philly's number one college radio station, WHIP, getting you ready for game six. Philadelphia Flyers going up against the New York Rangers. Rangers get the victory in game five by a final score of 4-2 to two to make this series at 3-2. Flyers on the brink of elimination. And now joining us on the hotline is the TV play-by-play voice of the Philadelphia Flyers on Comcast Sports Net, and that's Jim Jackson. Jim, it's Zach Gelb here in Philly. How you doing? Doing great, Zach. How are you? Well, I'm doing great, and I appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time on your busy schedule. And you look at this series, it's been back and forth. Rangers take game one, Flyers take game two, and then they exchange games back and forth throughout this whole series. I was in the Flyers locker room yesterday. Claude Giroux continues to remain confident as he's been all year long. And you look at this task, especially with the tough way the Flyers have played at MSG this year. If it does go to seven, uh, that would be tough to win on the road in a game seven atmosphere. But do you believe the Flyers have what it takes uh, to go out there and win these two games in a row? Well, it's certainly a tall order given that the games are also on back-to-back days, so it certainly won't be easy. But uh, this Flyers team has predicated itself uh, all year, basically, on, on doing the unexpected. And just when you're ready to count them out, they seem to, to come up and, and play well. So I wouldn't put anything past them, that, that's for sure. But a major challenge, no doubt about it. Yeah, they definitely have been a resilient group all year long. And I look at yesterday's game. They had a golden opportunity in those first 10 minutes. Uh, they got not one but two power plays, and they weren't able to capitalize on those two short men advantage. Uh, what do the, the uh, Flyers need to do, though, if they want to improve this power play unit? Well, I mean, their power play, you, know, you look at it, and a lot of teams seem to have trouble in the power play in the playoffs because, obviously, there are no secrets at this point. Um, and it, at this point, uh, it's not going to be easy to score because they've scouted you out, they've seen your power play, and they, they're great shot blockers. Uh, the Flyers have tried to use the other side of the ice from Claude Drew a little bit more, use Jake Voracek in the number one unit. Uh, that did help lead to a power play goal in game four, uh, but uh, then they really struggled, I, I think, in all areas of execution of the power play in game five. Some of it had to do with that ice at Madison Square Garden, uh, which wasn't helping either power play, and neither power player was able to score. Uh, but so it was just, just poor execution. Uh, they really need to keep it simple, and their power play is working at its best. They're getting pucks through, sometimes the team or team in with wrist shots even, but they're getting that the pucks down low, uh, either in, in rebound opportunities or with slap passes or uh, any kind of regular pass to Simmons and Hartnell, and then they're able to, to operate down there. And obviously they, they have sort of two quarterbacks in the power play, one being team and the other being Giroux. Uh, but they're really focusing on Giroux. There are times when the Rangers will have three players around them, even though they're shorthanded, which only leaves them with one other defensive player. So there's got to be open ice somewhere else, and that's what the Flyers are trying to do, concentrate on using that. Before this series started, I picked the Rangers in six, but one area that I thought the Flyers did have the advantage was on the offensive end, and that was mainly because Giroux and Simmons were red hot going into the postseason. Giroux picked up his first goal yesterday, hasn't generated a whole lot of shots in this series. I thought Wayne Simmons would need to be a major factor in front to get in the head of Henrik Lundqvist. We know the Rangers have good defenders in McDonough, Girardi, and Stahl, but what had the Rangers done to limit the production of those two stars in this series? Well, I'm not so sure. In, in Wayne Simmons' case, I think uh, Simmons just hasn't had that energy that he had during much of the regular season. Um, and if you're not getting shots through, that's going to cut off his effectiveness, at least in the power play, if not at 5-on-5-2, five five but certainly on the power play, because his game is predicated all upon getting to those loose pucks down low, doing something with rebounds, getting the pass down low, which they're also negating. So he's been nullified that way. Giroux, you know, a lot has been made of Claude Giroux in the series of, as it is, he has three points. He has, uh, he's a plus two player. He's a leading faceoff uh, performer for the Flyers by uh, a pretty significant margin over anybody who's taken a, a big number of draws. And only Dominic Moore has a better percentage than he does in the entire series. He's over 60%. So he's winning faceoffs. He's playing with grit, but there's just not much room for Claude. And when a team can really focus in on, on one guy, uh, you've got to find other options. The Flyers had seven 20-goal scorers during the regular season, and they're not getting much production from any of them. I mean, uh, uh, Jake Voracek does have a couple of goals, but outside of that, it's, uh, you know, Simmons has an empty netter only, uh, and several of the other guys, LeCavier has one goal, but it was uh, you know, just a shot that happened to bounce in, in, in game five. So they're not getting a ton of production. It's not just Claude Giroux. It's about the other players stepping up and, and uh, performing too because the Rangers have clearly set their sights on Claude Giroux as a guy that they're not going to let beat him. 
And looking at the opposition, Rick Nash has been a player that's been struggling as well. He's been getting the shots off, but he just hasn't been able to bury the puck in the back of the net. Is it just a matter of time before Nash scores? Because he's getting a lot of shots in this series. Yeah, I mean, didn't have any shots in Game 5, but he was easily the shots leader going into that. I think he's tied with Brad Richards now, 23 shots apiece. That's a lot of shots and no goals. I mean, you talk about Claude Giroux, who's only had, what, uh, 9 or 10 shots, uh, and he doesn't have any goals. But uh, in Nash's case, he's got 23 shots, and he doesn't have any goals. Now, obviously, Giroux has one, and Nash has none uh, in terms of goals for this series. So, yeah, and the, the heat's turned up on Nash. His team's up in this series, so not quite as much heat. But uh, he started to feel some pressure. A lot of stories written about him after Game 4 when the series got tied at 2, the fact that he hadn't scored. And he only has, what, two postseason goals and something like 21 career postseason games. Not not numbers you'd expect from a guy who's really been a scorer um, throughout his career in the regular season. So uh, I, I haven't gotten the feeling, to be honest with you, that he's getting closer to scoring. I, I thought he was not much of a factor at all in Game 5, did not have a shot. Um, uh, whereas Giroux, I thought, was really pushing and trying to, to, to become the force and, and eventually did get his goal. I haven't noticed that Nash has been all that dangerous in the last game or two. I thought he was a little bit more dangerous uh, uh, toward the end of game two. I thought he was starting to get it going and then somewhat in game three, but I think he's quieted down since then. So we'll see. I mean, there's pressure. Pressure can do different things to different people. We're spending a few minutes with the TV play-by-play voice of the Philadelphia Flyers on Comcast Sportsnet, and that's Jim Jackson as the Flyers get ready for a Game 6, down 3-2 here in Philadelphia at the Wells Fargo Center. And you mentioned Rick Nash. We talked about Claude Giroux. You even look at the Penguins. Uh, both Malkin and Crosby haven't registered a goal yet in, this, uh, in their respective series. What is it, though, with the elite players in the postseason and not scoring that goal in the first round? Because that's been something that's been alarming throughout these first rounds of these Stanley Cup playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes right back to the defense. Uh, They are going to target those players. In the regular season, you're targeted, but everything in the playoffs is amplified, and that includes the the checking, the ability, the the desire of the defenders to to go down and block shots and get in the way and do whatever they can to shut down the top players of the opposing team. So that all goes up. And there's also injuries, some that are concealed. There are a lot of people who think Sidney Crosby is not healthy. Uh, there are others who feel as though some of the other players in this series might not be a 100%. That That's out there and won't be known until after the team gets eliminated or wins the cup. But uh, bottom line is there's just focused attention defensively on all these guys, and that's why I thought the Flyers were in good shape going into these playoffs because they had the best scoring depth that they've had in quite a while. Certainly that the NHL had this year with seven twenty goal scores, but uh, that depth has not panned out at all in this series thus far. Elaine Vigneault said after the game yesterday he had, uh, was very impressed with how Gill, and he's called him a true professional. I know he finished with a minus two yesterday. Do you think the Rangers were targeting him a little bit just because he hasn't seen the ice that much this year? They could have been. I mean, I, I don't think that they changed their style much. They just went after everybody. I mean, how Gill's problems that have been talked about so much uh, resulted from a pass that was in his skates. Uh, that didn't have anything to do with the Rangers giving him extra attention, just had to do with Hal unable to come up with that pass from Braden Coburn. It went off his skate, bounced in the air. And, you know, Hal missed that scoring chance before the one goal, and then back the other way the Rangers came. That didn't have anything to do with extra attention toward Hal either. That just, it happened. Um, Hal, you know, he played only six games all year. He scratched 76 times. He stepped in, did his best. And, uh, you know, with the Rangers' speed, I'm not so sure that Eric Gustafson might not be the better choice. We'll see if if uh, Craig Ruby goes in that direction for game six, because uh, whereas you're getting small defensively, no question about it when you're talking about, you know, Kimo Timonen and uh, Eric Gustafson both playing, and Andrew McDonald's not the biggest guy in the world either, and Mark Streit, so you're not looking at a huge defense, but the Rangers, the way they forecheck, uh, I think the speed and the ability to move the puck might be more of a premium uh, against them than, let's say, a Boston Bruins team where you got the, some big four checkers that come in and you need that size back there perhaps to hold them off. Uh, it be interesting to see what decision he makes for game six, but, but for Al Gill, that's a tough position to be put in after having not played much at all all season long. The pace of the playoffs is that much quicker, and, and he had some, some things go against him. Uh, some of it was just bad luck, and some of it just uh, maybe – he wasn't quite as sharp as he could have been, but uh, to, to lay the, the loss at the feet of Hal Gill uh, would be ridiculous in Game 5. There were a lot of other players who uh, who just didn't uh, have their best games, too. But unfortunately, the mistakes that, that Hal made sort of were glaring there right out there. Everybody saw him, so they're jumping on him. But he was by no means the, the only nor the biggest problem the team had in their Game uh, 5 defeat.
No question about that as we're talking to Jim Jackson, who joins us right now on Philly's number one college radio station, WHIP. And you look at this Rangers offense, you're right, they have a lot of speed, especially with Zuccarello and Haglin. And you also see Brad Richards score two goals in this series. Marty San Luis is getting a stick on the puck. And then you have some guys that don't usually score that have been producing some goals. Uh, Dan Carcillo had one goal in that game three. Uh, Dom Moore has two goals in this series. But when you look at the Flyers, if they have to really stress the importance of one thing entering game six in the defensive end of this series, what would that be? I would would think it would be smarter puck movement, being able to deal with the Rangers' speed on the forecheck, um, and, you know, just keeping it simple, getting it out of the zone, and not trying to do too much. Uh, Execution, Craig Berube at practice, or after the optional practice they had today, was was talking about the team just needs to make decisions and and, uh, act on them more quickly. And so that's what you're looking at. He, he just thinks maybe that they're overthinking things. Maybe there's just too much going through their heads out there, and they just need to just just play. And that's uh, sort of what Kimo Timonen was saying too today. That uh, you know the team has to be more aggressive. And he wasn't talking about necessarily being more aggressive physically. That could be part of it, but but also just aggressive in terms of their their mentality, their attack mode mentality, and and not be worried so much about what the Rangers are doing, but be worried about what the Flyers are doing and how they can be better at it. Mason was spectacular in Game 4, had 35-plus saves since returning uh, from that injury that he suffered up against Pittsburgh, saw some limited action in Game 3. The other day, he allowed three goals, wasn't bad in net uh, whatsoever, but did the approach at least change a little bit on the Rangers' front? Did you see anything that had them generate a bit more offense to get some pucks past Mason? Uh, not really. They only had 22 shots on goal. I will say, in charting the scoring chances in that game, the Rangers, I thought, had more than the Flyers, even though they were on shot. So they were making their shots count, perhaps, more than the Flyers were. But I really didn't see anything. They said they were going to get in his face more, and, you know, Marty St. Louis did jump as that first goal. The, the shot was taken that, that could have distracted Mason, and he was bumped into a couple times in the game. But I, I didn't notice anything too much different. Uh, you know, Mason won the game for the Flyers in Game 4. There's no question about it. He was the first star. He was the reason they won that game. He did not win Game 5. He did not have the the same kind of outing. He was not a problem. Uh, He didn't lose the game for the Flyers, but he didn't win it either. He didn't uh, didn't steal another one. And I'm not so sure you can count on your goaltender to steal you more than one or maybe two games in a series. And that might be the scary part of the other end of the ice because I don't think Henrik Lundqvist has stolen a game for the Rangers yet either. And and he certainly has that in him. So... Uh, the Flyers could come out tomorrow and dominate a game, which they really haven't uh, in this series, and, and still lose if, if uh, Henrik is on his game. So that there, that's still a possibility, too. You never know with the goaltenders. But Mason was extraordinarily good in Game 4. He was just good in Game 5, and it wasn't good enough for his team because they had some other problems as well. On the way out here with Jim Jackson, you mentioned Henrik Lundqvist. You saw him last year uh, pitch two shutouts in games six and seven up against the Capitals, and uh, I believe he is due to have one of those big games coming up, and that couldn't be good news for the Flyers. But uh, you've seen in game three and four at the Wells Fargo Center, uh, game three, Rangers got the first goal. Uh, they got the, uh, the first goal again in game four. And when you're facing elimination, how important is it just to get that confidence up and get that first goal, especially with the Flyers playing at home? Yeah, I mean, they all talked about that today. The first period is very important tomorrow night, even though, as uh, we've seen through these playoffs, the first goal hasn't been very important in determining winners of games. There's been one series, I think, where the team that scores first, the Pittsburgh-Columbus series, I think the, the team that scored first has lost every game. But And in this series, three of the five times the, the team that scored first, they've lost uh, as far as the Rangers and, and Flyers go. So uh, by numbers, it doesn't seem to be that important. But I think tomorrow, for the psyche of the team, for the atmosphere in the building, for just the, the whole the getting them into a good frame of mind, I think a good first period is a must, and that would entail a lead. Uh, it might not entail a lead, but it would certainly help if they did. I mean, if they dominate the first period and maybe Lundqvist is great at 0-0 after one, that's not all bad. At least they've established some momentum, but I think it would help them, obviously, further if they got the lead with their fine play in the first period. So, yeah, beginning of the game, first 10 minutes, first 15, even the first 20, uh, very important for the Flyers tomorrow. They, they don't want to be playing from behind. The pressure really can melt you down in an elimination game if you fall behind because then you start thinking, oh, my, the season could be over. And, and that, that's pretty daunting once that, that those thoughts start creeping into your head. So uh, best to avoid that and get the lead and, and uh, feed off the energy of the crowd and, and just move forward. 
Jim, enjoy game six. We appreciate a few minutes of your time today. I'll make sure we'll stop by and sail up in the press box in the Wells Fargo Center. Thanks so much for a few minutes. Please do, guys. It was my pleasure.